Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Jerry Ryder. I work with the ARDC, the Australian Research Data Commons, and I'm based in Adelaide. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here today to our webinar, um, where we'll learn about some of the uh, latest updates to our online services and hear from uh, the ARDC DevOps Manager, Joel Ben, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So that's probably enough from me. Uh, I'd like to hand over now to Joel, who will take us through the recent changes to ANS Online Services. Uh, well, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, my name's Joel Ben, if you haven't met me. Um, I'm the DevOps Manager for Software Development within ANS, uh, well, ARDT, I should say. Um, and I'm going to walk through today some of the changes that we've put in um, for release 27 and 28. Um, so things to be covered today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the DOI service changes that were implemented in R28. Um, a new feature in Research Data Australia, uh, which is a relationships graph visualisation. Uh, as Jerry has mentioned already, the International Geosample Number Service um, that was developed. Um, and I'll go through the, the RVA, Research Vocabularies Australia notifications um, that we put in in uh, release 28. Um, sorry, I'm on a different computer and the mouse scrolls in the complete opposite way, um, so I'm bound to trip up a few times. Um, I'll start with the DOI changes. Um, so as part of R28, we put in a, a few changes um, which were sort of instigated from both data site and ANS. Um, we put out a an email um, for comment to all uh, DOI clients um, to feedback if there was any um, impacts on them. And one of the changes that we proposed was um, the removal of client identifiers from DOI strings. Um, so there's a little example up here where you can see uh, the top DOI um, it has got 16, which is a client identifier, and then the DOI is how it will look now um, without those identifiers. So in the early days when we um, initiated the DOI uh, system within ANTS, uh, we came up with the notion of, of putting client identifiers within the DOI strings so that we could A, identify whose DOIs were whose, um, and also in a, in a future enhancement, we were looking at doing some sort of reporting on the DOIs based on these identifiers. Now, the reporting never eventuated, and there are other, other ways now to, to get reports um, on your DOIs. Um, and there's also a new piece of functionality, which I'll go into in a minute, um, where DOIs can now be transferred uh, between owners. Um, so the, the client identifier sort of became redundant within the, within the DOI string. So we've decided to remove those out and it makes the DOI obviously a little bit simpler, um, a little bit clunkier, a little less clunkier, I should say. So the next change um, was around uh, providing a separate prefix to each one of our DOI clients. Um, so this was a request that came through from Datasite earlier um, this year, where they wanted uh, ANS to allocate a separate prefix to each one of our clients. Um, and they've taken this approach globally, so a lot of the other the clients that are, are working through Datasite already have separate prefixes for their clients. Um, and we were one of the ones that were sort of lagging behind in, in updating our system. Um, so Datasite asked us to do this um, for two reasons. One, it, it, it reduces the chance of identifier clashes when people are minting, so we, they're more likely to be unique when um, clients have their own prefix. Um, and it will also make, again, the DOI transfer between owners a bit easier. Uh, all clients as part of R28 have been updated, so everyone has their new pre prefix and uh, DOI clients have probably already noticed um, that these are sort of 10.2 something um, prefixes. And uh, any DOIs that were minted with the previous prefixes, so the 4225, 6 and 7, uh, will still be able to be updated by everybody, um, so that there shouldn't be any impacts um, to anybody in regards to this change. Um, one thing I will just make a note of is the prefix that are assigned aren't necessarily, um, well, they aren't a client's prefix because they can obviously be transferred with this new functionality, which I'll discuss in a second. Um, so they're not owned by a client, but they are allocated individually to clients. Uh, so the transfer of ownership. So um, some new functionality has been put in place within Datasite that allow or enables um, the transfer of DOIs between uh, different clients. Um, or even different allocators. So ANS is obviously an allocator, but it could be um, that another allocator signed up and we'd want to um, move to that allocator. So that can also be done. 
and it could be one DOI, it could be several DOIs, or it could be all DOIs uh, that a client has that need to be transferred. Um, to, to sort of um, start the process, you drop an email to services at ANS um, and they'll sort of walk you through the process. There's also some documentation up on the, the ANS documentation space um, outlining sort of the steps that will be required. Uh, but one of the main things is there will be um, sort of an email or, a, or a, uh, I guess a sign sort of acceptance of the transfer of the DOIs between um, parties. Um, so that the new party that's going to be the owner has to sort of uh, agree to be taking these on board and, and be the manager going forward. Uh, the last one I'll just go on in the DOI changes. We, when we put out the proposal for R28, um, we also were proposing to move to a new uh, method of, of testing through the DOI service. And this was, the idea was to have a single test account um, for everybody. So there'd be just be one account that people um, would hit. All the DOIs that people who were, were testing would be listed under that single account. And we did receive um, some valid feedback from clients and, and some concerns about this approach. So we postponed that change um, and we're coming up with a new proposal which will be sent out in a few weeks time um, for comment. And then we were aiming to sort of release that in release 29. Um, and, and we're sort of aiming for the lowest impact possible on our clients. Um, so we'll be in touch. Um, the next, the next piece of functionality is the Research Data Australia Relationships Graph. Um, so you can see on the right here, this is kind of what it looks like, and I'll go into the system in a second. Um, so this, uh, this, this originated from some work um, coming out of Research Data Alliance, and it was a project um, which was dubbed the Research Data Switchboard. And, and this project basically aggregates information from different publishers and, and sort of areas of research output and draws connections between those um, to provide value. So we've sort of taken the, that idea into Research Data Australia for our own data. Um, and the graph provides a visual representation of the relationships within RDA. And one of the things that the graph uh, sort of does that, that we can't see in an RDA, in, in the existing RDA, um, was provide valuable, valuable information between the relationships, uh, between the relationships between objects, sorry, that can't easily be seen in a list view. And I'll, and I'll show some examples in a second once I get into the system. Um, we're looking at a future enhancement where we'll actually be pulling information out of the research data switchboard. Um, so this will be things like um, where the research data switchboard knows about orchids that are connected to, say, research outputs like publications or data that we don't have in RDA. So that will sort of be a nice value add. There are some known issues, uh, primarily with Internet Explorer at the moment. We're having some issues with uh, the rendering of SVGs in IE, um, 11 and Edge. Um, so we're working on that at the moment and we'll hopefully get it fixed out soon. Uh, the graph does still display, but it's not as pretty as it should be. Um, so I'll flick over to the system so we can have a, a quick look. Let's put that over here. Yep. Um, so here is a data set within Research Data Australia. I'll just scroll down, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so I've just scrolled down to sort of where the relationships section starts within a data set record in RTA, and you can now obviously see that we've got this uh, part of the car, which is the, the graph visualisation. By default, when you come in, uh, it's, it's kind of minimised down so that we didn't take up too much real estate within the record, but it also gives, gives uh, users a sort of indication that there is something there. Um, you can hover your mouse over and it will tell you to sort of click to explore the graph, um, but there's also this expand and collapse icon on the right here. So underneath is the sort of view that we've had in the existing system up until now. So this is the list view of the relationships between uh, the objects that are either within RDA or external to RDA. And the graph view basically is not a one-to-one -one representation of that list view because it does provide additional information. But what we can see in the graph is, and I'll just reorganise this a little bit, a little bit easier to see. Um, we have this node. Here, which is representing the current collection that I'm viewing or the data set that I'm viewing, and it's what we call a primary node, um, and it's indicated by this grey ring around the collection. Uh, you can hover over each of the nodes and it will give you the title and the type. So we can see here that we've got a data set and this is the title um, for it. So we can do that to each of the nodes. If we want to navigate off, so if this, this object exists in RDA um, or it is a resolvable link, so a link on the web, well actually the title of the, the, the node will be provided as a link and you can click on that and navigate off to say a website, a publication or another object within Research Data Australia. 
Uh, the relationships between each of the nodes in the graph are displayed on uh, this sort of connector. So we can see um, here we have an association between uh, two data sets. Um, and you can also hover over uh, the connectors to, to find out the text for that relationship as well. There are instances where uh, there are multiple relationships between two nodes. So if I come over uh, between this uh, group and an activity, I can see that they're connector actually has a text multiple on it. And if I hover over that, I can see that there's multiple relationships and they're expressed uh, between the, the activity and the, the group there. Um, what are things that, that you can do um, within the graph? So you can obviously um, zoom with in and out within the graph. Sorry, I'll just down. Yeah. This mass is going to cause me problems. You can also re reposition the graph. Um, so when you start to get a really big graph, you can zoom quite far out and reposition it to sort of uh, fit the whole lot in view. You can also explore other nodes with the graph. So when the, the graph first loads, we, we get the primary node and any sort of uh, direct relationships to that node or um, some other nodes, which I'll discuss in a minute. But there's also a way to explore these, these extra nodes that are displayed in the graph. So we can see between this data set, we have uh, what's the, managed by this party, which is John Scott. Now, whoever's discovered this record, they may have come from Google um, doing a search and they've, they've discovered this data set. And what they've found is they found that John Scott's actually the manager of this data set. And I may, may like to know uh, what other data sets John has a connection to. So what we can do is we can click on, double click on John, and this will basically attempt to load any other relationships that John has within Research Data Australia. So this has brought in another node um, that's directly related to John. So from this, um, you can see that this node is, is quite a bit bigger, and this is what we call a cluster node. And we basically put clusters within the graph when there are more than 20 single nodes with the same relationship to another node, and they are the same type. So if I hover over the cluster, you can see here that we've got 103 data sets that are managed by John. And one of the nice things in the clusters are that they, a, they tidy up the graph a bit. So if I didn't have the cluster, I would have 103 nodes on my graph, making it look a bit like a hedgehog. But it also provides a way to access these, these records within RDA. So all these data sets, they exist in RDA. And the link up here will basically take me to a search result where I can then further filter those, those records down by all the, the other filters within RDA. So it might be uh, by subjects or by type. Um, it just makes it a little bit easier to sort of, uh, I guess, find what the user might be looking for. I'll just flip back to the graph. Um, in terms of, of highlighting the relationships within the graph, you can hover your mouse over a node and it will basically gray out that anything that's not directly related to the node that you're hovering over. Um, so we can see this activity is related to almost everything except the, the data set on the right and the, the cluster above. Um, one of the things that, that can happen um, is if there are no additional relationships and you double click a node, it'll basically just sit there. Um, but this activity, um, again, the user might have come across this collection and they want to find out, oh, there's, there's a bit of interest here because um, this collection or this data set is an output of an activity. What else came out of this activity? So I can double click on the activity like I did before for John. And this will know, uh, load any of the relationships to this activity. Now, what we'll get is an extremely busy graph. So I'll just zoom out a bit. And now we can see that this activity that we've just double clicked on has relationship to a lot of other data. Um, and, and this is obviously a, a really good way to say, um, you know, that there's more information within RDA than what you can see within the list view. And if the user wanted to drill down into some of these activities, there's, there's clusters in here, um, or they can go to the activity record itself and, and find out more about that activity in, in some of the outputs. Um, Go over to another example. So here's just another example where we can see some other object types. So uh, I'm showing this example because both uh, this object, which is a website, and this publication here, they don't actually exist within Research Data Australia, um, but we can navigate off to those publications and websites um, based on the, on the link within the, the tooltip. 
The other thing I'd like to mention is uh, this was sort of the first iteration. We are in the process of updating um, the graph already, and that will come out in the next couple of weeks. Um, so there is, uh, I guess, a limitation at the moment within the, the current uh, version of the graph in that there is no controls um, to manoeuvre the zoom in and out on a graph. So if the user doesn't have a scroll wheel, um, they're really, really stuck in terms of what they can do with the graph. Um, so this is sort of work in progress, um, but you can see we've got some controls up here where we can uh, zoom in and, in and out of the graph. And where we have, I don't know if any of these nodes have lots and lots of connections, um, but if we were to say, we can recenter the graph if it was quite big um, to fit things within the view. We also have a link to help. Um, which opens the research data at Australia Help. Um, so there'll be a new tab in the RDA Help, which sort of describes um, sort of the, the different types of nodes that you can have um, and how to, how to work with the graph and what's represented within the graph. Um, so that will be coming out in uh, probably about two weeks' time. So, so keep an eye out for that. I can't see any questions in there. Jerry, can you just let me know if there are any questions? I'm finding it really hard on this computer. Oh. So we do have one on that. We do have one on that particular aspect uh, of the graph um, from uh, Nick, who uh, asked, "Is there a way to find out more about a relationship on the graph than just the label of the relationship, like a definition for it?" So I think uh, that may have been answered a bit later in your presentation. Yeah, I mean, there's there's not a lot in the in RDA in terms of uh, the description of those relationships. We do obviously have pages on the, the ANS website for the RIVCS documentation which describes those relationships, um, but that could be a, an enhancement we look at in the future to provide a bit more information within those pop-outs about the, the sort of uh, the, the relationships. Um, okay, so the next feature uh, I'm going to go through is the ANS IGSN service. Um, so those who don't know what an IGSN is, uh, it's an International Geo Sample Number, and they are globally unique persistent identifiers for physical samples and specimens. Um, they're citable and they facilitate the linking between samples, related data, publications, and people. And the, the global sort of IGSN system is managed by, by the IGSN EV organization, and technically it's underpinned by the handle system. Um, so that they work, uh, they're very similar, I guess as DOIs um, in that you have some metadata that's associated with the identifier that describes the object um, and they're unique, they're persistent and they're resolvable. Um, so you can see underneath here I've got an example of how a IGSN looks. So pretty similar to a DOI, we have sort of a prefix and then sort of a suffix which, which is actually the identifier portion, um, I guess the, the unique portion. Um, and you can obviously resolve them, being on a pin by the handle service, you can under, you can resolve them via handle.net. Um, yeah. Backwards again. Uh, so in terms of the ANS IGSN service, uh, this was a collaboration between Oscope ANS and CSIRO, and it was implemented as part of the, the Geosciences Data and uh, Enhanced Virtual Laboratory project. Um, it's I guess based upon uh, IGSN software that was written by CSIRO and enhanced a little bit for ANS uh, needs. It's free to use um, and intended for use by the Australian Earth Science Research Community. Uh, it's accessed via the OSCOPE website and requires AAF login at this, at this stage. Now when users go to mint an IGSN, uh, they're required to provide, um, or when you mint an IGSN, you're required to provide a minimum set of metadata and also a landing page. So there obviously needs to be somewhere where that IGSN resolves to. Um, when users mint through the ANS IGSN service, uh, the, the web interface I should say, um, the landing page is actually created for the user based on the metadata that they're entering. entering. So there's no need for them to host uh, the landing page somewhere on their own systems. It's all done within the, the end service. Uh, if users are using the API service, then they will need to host the page somewhere uh, or we'll talk to ANS about possibly hosting that for them. Um, we are obviously at the moment it is uh, pretty much restricted, or not restricted, but intended for use by uh, the geoscience community. Um, but ANS is obviously interested in, in extending the service out uh, for other physical sample types. And I guess I should mention that the IGSN, the international IGSN, um, is also looking at expanding things out um, for other sample types. So if there are any um, anyone on the line um, that's interested in their different domains, um, 
then they can get in touch with ANS and, and we can talk through a process for extending the service. Uh, the other thing to mention is that both CSIRO and Geoscience Australia also have IGSN services. Um, so we're at the ADAC ANS IGSN service is really focusing in on the, the sort of uh, research community, the acad academic research community, which is not really covered by Geosciences or, or CIRO, uh, Geoscience Australia or CSIRO. Um, so I'll just we'll go into the system for a second. Hopefully this works. So as I said, the, the way to access is through the Oscope website. Um, so I'm just clicking into Oscope. Um, so this is the access point within uh, the Oscope website. Uh, it tells you a little bit, a little bit about IGSN um, and some of the conditions that apply for using the service. So it obviously has to be associated with Australian research. Um, need to provide a minimum set of metadata, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to access the service, uh, there's a link down the bottom here, which is click here to access the ANS IGSN service. Um, and I'll just point out that there is also some documentation on the ANS website um, that's linked to from this page. So click in. This will navigate me off to the AF, where I can choose my institution. So as I, as I sort of mentioned before, the, the service is free. Um, anyone with an AEF can log in like I just did. You don't uh, need to be affiliated with an organisation like our other services at this point in time. Um, so anyone that logs in through the Oscope website kind of gets a, an affiliation to Oscope. Um, so anyone in the geoscience community, we sort of track through the Oscope login. Um, once you're in, you basically get, uh, you land on sort of the, the page to mint an IGSN. Um, I'll point out just before we get into it, just at the top we have uh, a link to some documentation, so that's a little bit of help around the form. Uh, you can log out, uh, you can list your resources that you've already minted in the past, where you can sort of manage those so you can go in and edit those um, or view them, um, and a link to obviously to add another resource. Now in terms of the form, um, there's a number of uh, required fields which are highlighted in red um, and they're really around uh, describing sort of the core elements of a sample. So um, sort of the, the sample type, uh, the material type and who's the curator for that sample. Uh, you can also set the, vis the visibility of the metadata. So if I click on the drop down here, um, you can have metadata for this IGSM publicly visible. So that will obviously be resolvable within the AND service. You can have it private. So if someone does try and resolve it, it will actually get to a, a um, sort of a login page and they'll have to have access before they can view that. And you can also put your IGSMs under an embargo um, for a certain time period. And then once that embargo elapses, the, the metadata automatically becomes publicly visible. In terms of the other fields, so if I scroll down a little bit, um, you can obviously describe uh, location, pretty important for a lot of physical samples. And then you can go into describe sort of related, related resources. So you might have uh, other contributors that you want to describe, um, and you can put in some relationship types and contributor types between uh, the, these uh, objects. Related resources, so you might want to relate, uh, relate to publications and data or even other IGSNs. Uh, there might be a sort of a hierarchy between the IGSNs where you have uh, a core sample that's then broken down into two individual samples that you sort of want to link together. There is uh, another information tab which is sort of uh, excess metadata um, around the IGSN. Um, so you can put in some classifications, uh, the method that was used, and also link to a project and any other comments. Um, to do with the sample. Now, I'll point out that there are the link context help um, items for each of the, the fields. Um, sometimes they, they make uh, sense, sometimes they're a little bit um, ambiguous, um, but this is a lot of this is uh, sort of the code that, that we, we took on board and we will um, enhance going forward. Um, once you've minted one, so I'll just mint uh, a sample, make it publicly visible. I'll just fill out the basic bit up here and say it's nice. And so 
So once I've registered notice, it sends, it takes a little while, obviously, because we're hitting sort of the, the global system um, to, to register with IGSN and then obviously into the handle system. Uh, you'll get a little pop out to say that your, your handle's been minted um, and you can find that the resolution URL here. You can view the metadata, add another IGSN or just click OK, which leads you on this page and you can basically use the same metadata to register another IGSN with a few tweaks. Um, but I'll click on the view metadata and it will take me over to the view page and that's really big. I'll see if I can just zoom out a little bit. Um, and this is basically the landing page that gets generated for your IGSNs within the web GUI. Um, so whenever somebody resolves one of your public uh, IGSNs, this is the metadata page that they will land on. They obviously won't be logged into the system, won't be able to edit, um, but this is the descriptive metadata that they will find. And if I put sort of locations in the map, that would show up here. Now, if you are the owner of the IGSN and you are logged in, there is an edit button. Um, or you can find in your list resources, you can find the IGSNs that you've missed in the past and view and edit um, those as you, as you need. So it might be that it was private and you, you now want to make it um, public, um, or vice versa, you can go in and edit, edit the metadata and republish that IGSN. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it on IGSN. Um, this live, we will be putting out um, a minor update which uh, in the next few, uh, I think probably the next couple of weeks, um, where we're going to make it a little bit easier for users to link to um, ORCID IDs and grant information um, related to, to samples. So that should be coming out in the next few weeks. I missed anything there. So, Joel, we do have one question about the IGSN service. Yep. Uh, Nick's asking, uh, is Anne's posting IGSN metadata directly to the IGSN server, service? The reason he yep. asks is there's only one handle server for IGSNs internationally and uh, maybe there's a requirement for some redundancy. Yep, totally agree. No, we are sending the metadata directly to IGSN um, and I believe that there is an application um, going in for some funding for IGSN. I don't know the, the exact specifics, but um, if they get that funding, I think there's going to be some work on uh, the metadata kernel and making the system a little bit more robust. Um, but to answer Nick's question, we are sending it directly to the IGSN service um, and they have a single uh, handle a prefix for that. So yeah, there, there is a need for redundancy there. Okay, thanks, Joel. That's okay. Um, okay, so the next uh, item is the RBA notifications. So again, this one was put into uh, R28. Um, and what I'll say is, uh, before I get into the notification stuff, um, we have done a, a huge amount of work for Research Vocabularies Australia in the last six to eight months. Um, there is very little of it which is noticeable to the end user. But basically the whole uh, back end of RBA was rewritten in the last eight months. And some of the real benefits of that are things like the notification system that we can implement. Um, there's also an API which is currently being documented and will be released um, in the next few weeks. So that will allow users to uh, basically communicate with the RVA system uh, machine to machine and, and publish uh, vocabularies. And it's also enabled us to, to put in lots of hooks for future enhancements um, that are sort of sitting in the backlog that people have asked for. So we've done a huge amount of work in RBA, um, so things are looking pretty good there. Now in terms of the notification system, uh, these allow users to subscribe basically to, to vocabs or vocab owners um, and it allows them to stay up to, up to date with any of the changes or when new vocabularies are published. So the list here, uh, users have the choice of subscribing to mailing lists for uh, changes to a specific vocab um, or they can uh, subscribe to any vocabs from that owner, so that is new or changed vocabs, um, or they can subscribe to everything in RVA. So whenever a vocab is changed or uh, a new vocabulary is published, they'll get a digest email um, to notify them. At the moment, emails are sent out weekly on Wednesday mornings. So when you subscribe, you don't actually have a choice of frequency at this point in time. Um, they're just they're just on a weekly basis on Wednesday mornings. Um, so I'll flick over into RBA. Um, it just shows how the system looks.
Uh, where am I going? Switch. So basically, I'll just jump into any, any vocab. You can see at the top here, um, in the title bar, there's now a subscribe label. So basically, we can click that and it will open a subscription dialog box. And this is where you can basically subscribe and, and sort of add your preferences to, to the mailing lists. Um, so we can see here that I'd like to subscribe to a weekly email digest. And as I said, there are those sort of three choices at this stage where you can assign, um, subscribe to the individual vocabulary. Um, all the vocabularies from the owner ANS. So ANS is the vocabula vocabulary owner for this agribock. Um, or new or changed vocabularies from all owners within uh, RBA. Um, so there's a radio button group, you select one, one of those. Um, there's also an option here to be notified of any service updates and features. So this is when we do service uh, software updates to, to RBA. You can tick that box and that will add you to the mailing list for RBA features and updates. Um, and that will be sent out on as, as needed uh, basis. So whenever we do a software update to RBA, we'll send out an email to all the, the users on that mailing list. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you just put in a, an email address. Address um, has to be valid, obviously. Um, we do have capture in place. Um, most of the time, the capture will realise that you are an end user and you won't actually have to do uh, the capture. Um, clicking on images, um, and then you can just click subscribe. And we'll see if this comes up. No, I didn't need to do it, um, and it will basically just say that you've successfully successfully subscribed to that mailing list. Um, so on a weekly basis, let me just see if I can get this. There's always something that goes wrong. Um, not sure. Give me two seconds. Um, while Joel's um, sorting out that little technical glitch, we have had a question from Jackie um, asking about whether uh, some journals are actually requiring IGSN samples. Um, IGSNs for samples in order for articles to be published, um, which is becoming increasingly a requirement for research data. Um, so as far as I'm aware, um, that's not yet a requirement, um, but there are a number of journals that uh, will enable uh, the linking from a journal article to an IGSN and they're actively supporting and encouraging that. Um, we do have a, a page on the um, AIDC website or the ANS website that provides some background about IGSN generally, what they are, uh, how they can be used, how they can be cited. And I'll, I'll pop that uh, URL into the question pod so that people can follow up uh, it may be useful too if you're talking to colleagues or, or, or uh, researchers about IGSN just to give a bit more background on uh, what they are and how they can be used. Sorry about uh, that. No worries, Joel, over to you. Yeah, sorry, I had the address completely wrong. I should have put it in the slides, would have been easier. Um, so I've just come into the, the test mail server just to show an example of sort of a weekly digest email that gets sent out. Um, so this is basically what users will receive. Um, if they've subscribed to uh, whatever mailing list, but no changes have been um, that have happened within that week, they won't actually receive an email. So it's only when things actually change um, that, that impact the preferences that they have. Um, so here's an example of a weekly digest. Um, so we basically, it's the email is sort of broken into um, a number of sections. I don't know if I've got one here that's got. Sorry to be flicking around. Um, so this one, you can see there's a section here which is to do with uh, vocabularies that you're subscribed to directly. Um, we can see here the name of the vocab and there is a link off, off to that vocab um, directly within RBA. 
And then we can see a list of sort of the changes that have taken place over the last week. Um, so it will tell you if the status of the vocabulary has changed, it's not obviously here. Um, and then it will tell you sort of the descriptive metadata elements that were changed. Um, so we can see that the title was changed within the last week. And then it's broken down a little bit further into the version changes. So it'll, it'll detail sort of the things that have, that have changed within each of the versions. Um, so we can see that a new version, this another version here, was added and it's set to current, which means that the other two versions that were there uh, would have been updated to superseded. Um, there are some changes to, to NEI version one here. The version is no longer published by the Linked Data API. So some of the flags within the, the CMS in RBA were changed for this version. And then down the bottom of the, the email, there is a button which allows you to, to obviously manage your subscription preferences. So because there's no uh, requirement for users to log in when they subscribe, the only way that they can sort of get to manage their subscriptions is through their email. So until you get an email, you can't actually update your subscription preferences. So you have to wait for the first email to come through. Um, the other example I've shown before, the, the other section that's within the email are um, owner changes. So where you've subscribed to particular owners or all owners um, within RVA, it's sort of it'll break down the vocabularies under each of those owners. Um, so I think this one, Anne's, might have several. So here's Anne's as the owner, and we have the different vocabularies under the owner that have changed. And we can see here this one's actually had quite a lot of changes um, within the sort of last reporting period. Uh, I'll scroll to the bottom. Um, click Manage the Subscriptions button, and that will take you back to RVA. And uh, this is the Manage Subscriptions page, where you can obviously um, unsubscribe from each of your, prefer your preferred mailing lists. Again, it's, it's broken down into that sort of two uh, categories. So we have the vocabularies that you directly subscribe to, and also the publishers that you subscribe to. Now, I'll just point out that the two options down the bottom here, we have all. Um, so this is that sort of special um, category um, where you want to be notified of everything. Um, but you can also specify that you're um, interested in, in just vocabs from this owner. So the, the second or third option down here, the AU testing role, um, is not really required at this stage because you're going to get everything anyway from the first option. Um, but we can obviously unsubscribe from that one and leave AU testing there. Um, it's pretty much as simple as that. Where you are subscribed to um, the service updates, so the software sort of updates, um, notifications, there is also another option that's displayed on this page, um, which is, enables you to, to unsubscribe from, from that mailing list as well. So I think that's pretty much it. Um, there is obviously some documentation around each of these uh, pieces of functionality. So um, I think we're going to send out the slides so that the links will be in there if you want to sort of um, investigate a little bit further and read some of the documentation. Um, but that's pretty much everything. Are there any questions that sort of didn't answer or people have? There, yeah, thank you, Joel. And thank you for bravely doing so many live demos. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> it's it does, it does enhance, uh, you know, being able to see the actual functionality. Yeah. Um, we do have one question unanswered, and it's uh, back on the IGSN service from Les, who asks, can the metadata be extracted from an IGSN over some kind of service? Yep, absolutely. So one of the, the requirements of, of running an IGSN service is to have a publicly accessible OAI um, BMH endpoint. So we have that running. Um, any of the metadata, any of the metadata associated with public um, IGSNs or ones that had a embargo periods that have expired will be available via that service. Um, that service will also be used to feed into the Australian IGSN uh, portal, which is run by CSIRO at this stage. Um, so they'll be harvesting from us as well, and that will be discoverable through that service. Well, we don't have any more questions come in now, so um, I think we'll give ourselves uh, an early minute. Thank you again, Joel, for your time and for running us through what's been an awful lot of work being done uh, by the uh, dev team. And thanks to all our participants for coming along today, for your questions, and we certainly hope to see you at another webinar again soon.